Vinay Prasad, uh, great to be with you. Thanks for joining. I thought maybe we could chat about some of the recent uh, news on the J&J vaccine um, from the FDA. They're trying to, to stop it now. They're basically shutting it down for a period of time. Have you uh, seen the headlines? Yeah, thanks for thanks for chatting with me, Marty. Yeah, we're talking about the pause, and uh, it, they call it the pause. And I guess they're put a hold on J and J vaccination in this country for a few days. And it seems like everyone else has followed suit. Most states, the District of Columbia, um, putting a hold on J and J because of this um, this issue of uh, several women. I think the the number I last saw was six out of something like between six and seven million vaccinations um, have come down with uh, uh, thrombosis. And it seems like, although we don't know for sure, uh, that that thrombosis is likely cerebral vein thrombosis, um, at least if it's consistent with the AstraZeneca experience. So that's where we are right now. It's a, it's a, it's a rapidly changing moment. Now, you're a hematologist. Why is it cerebral vein thrombosis? And is this the sort of thrombosis you wanna anticoagulate or is it more like a DIC picture? Oh, well, um, it's above, those are all above my pay grade, Marty. I am a hematologist, but um, I guess I would say that, um, you know, as a general rule of thought, um, you know, we do tend to anticoagulate cerebral vein thrombosis. The evidence for that is surprisingly scant, a couple small randomized control trials. Um, sometimes in these cerebral vein thrombosis situations, we actually also get hemorrhage, and there is a lot of debate, but a number of hematologists often anticoagulate through hemorrhage because we believe this is a backflow problem when we actually get that situation. Um, it's not a great place to be with the cerebral vein thrombosis and, and concomitant hemorrhage. Um, but why does it appear that the a, that AstraZeneca AstraZeneca and potentially Johnson & Johnson may be linked to CVT. Why um, is this also looking a little bit like um, it may have a similar pathophysiology to heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis or HIT? Um, people are calling vaccine-induced uh, thrombocytopenia and thrombosis or VIT. Um, the answer is uh, very unclear. I mean, we only have the first scattered scattered reports the, the, of, of, of what might be going on in terms of biology. So this, this looks like it's <clears throat> a function of the adenovirus vector of the vaccine. We're not seeing it at all in the mRNA vaccines. But tell me this, uh, Vinay, help me understand this. Six cases of blood clots out of about 7 million administrations and one death, and they shut it down? I mean, Help me understand, if, if they started doing that with all the medicines we use in medicine, we wouldn't have Tylenol. I mean, we wouldn't have 50% of the meds we have. Whatever happened to the risk-benefit evaluation that a physician does and ex explaining risks to patients and letting them make a decision? Yeah, so, I mean, you're, you're raising a really interesting question, um, which is, I guess one is the policy question, what do you do when you get this information in your door? And we can talk about that. I guess one is the absolute risk question. And I guess I would say that although many people point out um, that you know we, we have six documented cases, the denominator might be between six and seven million, I think we don't know for sure exactly what the frequency of this event is for a couple of reasons. Among all the people we vaccinated, probably the majority are older, potentially over the age of 65. This event, uh, at least the documented cases of it, um, appear to be in, in younger people um, where the denominator might be smaller. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if uh, at the end of this pause, people say similarly, like they say for AZ, this event might occur as frequently as one in 100,000 or one in 250,000. But, but, but put that aside, you know, which is that I don't know exactly what the frequency is going to be. One, you know, I, anything from one in 70,000 to one in a million, you know, I think that's the ballpark we're talking about. But you're making a very astute point, which is about how do we think about risks like that, really infrequent risks, uh, when you weigh that against, on the other hand, the risk of getting SARS-CoV-2 and having bad things happen to you. And the answer is throughout this pandemic, I think we have done a very poor job of communicating to the public how you ought to think about those risks. I think that's true with everything from school closure to whether or not you should wear a mask after you're vaccinated. We do a poor job of thinking about low frequency risks. Uh, we always have, and, and that's bled into this pandemic. You know, I just think about the FDA's role. What is their role? Is it really to ensure that drugs brought to market are relatively safe given the risks and benefits? You know, I see the FDA as having a job really to protect us from snake oil or misleading claims. Now they're actually stepping into the doctor's office and saying people should not be getting this vaccine right now. And, and I just cannot understand when you have one death out of 7 million, I, I am not understanding 
the FDA's role. It seems like they've crossed over from, you know, protecting us from snake oil into paternalism. And, and now I understand why they still have not approved the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, right? If it's like, and then, I don't think they are experts in rationing, which is what exactly the scientific field that we're living in right now, right? Rationing a scarce life-saving resource, totally downplaying the maximizing first dose approach that the UK used successfully, oh, yeah. right? Totally shutting down a life-saving vaccine that by the way, is more likely to access rural communities and lower income populations because it doesn't require the freezer chain. And it's like when you're weighing risks and benefits, to me, the benefit is still there. If, I wouldn't recommend it for childbearing age women because sure. that's where we're seeing the complications. But it seems to, to me, you know, we had a couple hundred people die yesterday from COVID. There's one death out of 7 million for the vaccine. To me, you know, it seems like it, you know, still worth piping out there, but I, I wouldn't make that decision for anybody. I would give them the statistics, right? I would. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're making an interesting point. And I guess the, the, the first part I want to, to emphasize is that I do think you're right that at times they are uh, risk averse and it hurts us. And I think the two versus one vaccine debate was exactly that point. Um, on this question, I think it is interesting because I think where might we settle out? And we might settle out with J and J similarly to how we settled out with AZ in European countries, which means um, it, that which means that different countries have a different threshold of who benefits. So who might be the people you even think about a vaccine with some side effect in? I would say if you're older, if you have comorbidities, and if you're in a hot spot where there's explosive SARS-CoV-2 transmission, the risk benefit to you might far exceed any uh, harm, such as Michigan right now. Um, if you're younger, if you're in a region where there is low SARS-CoV-2 transmission, if you have no comorbidities, um, the risk benefit calculus may be the other way. And what you're talking about is um, a one size fits all uh, 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 legislation by the FDA to try to do that all at once. I think you're right. It's very difficult. Um, we will see how long the pause is. Um, we will see whether or not it was a wise move in retrospect. Um, but I think you're, you're asking a fair question. Um, if, if I, I think we will be able to get a better sense of the frequency of this event soon. Um, and, I, and, I, and I do think, um, we can talk about it in a second, but I think what, what to me is very interesting about this is that um, this is allowing us to have a discussion about vaccination that I think has been a bit taboo until this point, which is, um, is the right vaccine for the right person? Does it matter based on how old you are? Uh, and, and what kind of evidence do you need when we start to vaccinate uh, the very youngest among us, like children, um, who we know have very low risk of SARS-CoV-2 bad outcomes? And so I think now we can start to have this conversation about trade-offs, which is really a conversation we should have been having all along. You know, I, I get the pause. I believe in the pause. I think mm -hmm. the FDA yeah. should pause the J&J &J vaccine, but not for everybody. All of these reports, as rare as they are, are all concentrated in one group. Pause it in that group and, and let the others know what's happening in that group so they can choose to cancel the appointment that they had for tomorrow and wait two weeks to get another appointment. Or they can say, you know what, I think I'm okay. I mean, that's, that's what I'm having such a tough time with right now. Um, when people have asked us, even I, what vaccine should I get? We've generally been saying, get the first one you can. Right. Now, what are you thinking about telling folks? Now I think, uh, well, first of all, I've never been saying that. <laughs> no, I've always, <laughs> I mean, I always think, um, you know, these decisions are uh, simple slogans don't always capture individual patient level decisions. I think that's what you're getting at, Marty. You're getting at this fact that being a doctor and making patient care decisions has always been individualized between doctors and patients, and it always will be to the end of time. Um, I think what you are suggesting right now is that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, which are widely used, um, appear at this point to have never shown a safety signal at any age. And so I think most adults, um, there's a really good reason uh, to suspect that you will benefit on average from getting that. Um, and you should go on with that. When it comes to J&J &J, um, in this country, I do think you should have to factor in after the pause, of course, you will have to factor in your age. 
Um, you'll have to factor in your risk of SARS-CoV-2 bad complications, and you'll have to factor in the community spread of SARS-CoV-2 in your area. And I think you're making a good point that you know what might be best for an old, frail person who is in a high prevalence county in Michigan right now um, might be different than what's best for a young female living in California in a county that has very low transmission. And this is the kind of dialogue that we should have been having all along about the vaccine. Um, it's also the dialogue that we will eventually have to have when it comes to vaccinating 12 year olds and 13 year olds and 14 year olds, I think it's an important dialogue to have. What will they stand to gain and what might they stand, um, what risks might they, uh, might still be uncertain. I like that approach, I, I, that's, that's good. I, you know, just to summarize here, it looks like what we know right now, uh, the day that the FDA is basically shutting down the J&J vaccine altogether in every group by recommending that people don't get it, that's how they're doing it. They're not pulling back the EUA right. yet. Correct. Um, is what we know is there's six women of childbearing age who have developed a clot. Um, the clot looks like it's in a cerebral vein and one person has died. So that's what we know right now. Now, I agree more people are going to come out. There's there's no doubt that number is going to go up as it did in Europe right. with a similar adenoviral vector vaccine. Right. It, it appears as if the adenoviral vector vaccines do something, maybe because they come from mammalian lines, I've heard one scientist explain, different from the mRNA vaccines, but uh, they're doing something to increase inflammation, which is a risk factor for clots. So they maybe, I mean, one other possibility is these are DNA vaccines um, and, and, and they may be doing something um, to platelet factor four, uh, which is uh, getting the body to generate autoantibodies against platelet factor four, which has been implicated as a, as a causal mechanism of the heparin induced thrombocytopenia. And you're getting kind of a picture similar to HIT uh, in the absence of heparin exposure, at least in the AstraZeneca case. Um, it will take some time to, I think, fully elucidate that pathophysiology. Um, but I will say one thing that I think this episode has uh, brought into the forefront, which is um, when we talk about anything around SARS-CoV-2, when we talk about opening and closing schools, you know, you and I have always acknowledged there are pros and there are cons of, of making these kind of policy choices. And since we're policy people, we think about what we might stand to benefit and what we might stand to lose. And that kind of thinking I believe has been largely absent from SARS-CoV-2 discussions. You hear very absolute positions like we should close all the schools or we should open all the schools. You know, nothing nuanced or in between that acknowledges that maybe under some circumstances you do close schools, but maybe schools do provide a net value to people. And I think after months of messaging, even one bad event is problematic um, and we can not talk about trade-offs at all. I, I guess I'm not surprised to see um, that this is going to have implications uh, and, ve and very difficult to walk back in the public. And I guess the last thing I'd say is, unfortunately, we have a sizable fraction of Americans um, who have expressed uh, deep reservations about vaccination and may have said many things that are erroneous about other vaccines. And I worry that an episode like this um, may provide a lot of gasoline on that fire. Um, and we uh, do not yet know the full implications of that. So, you know, when it comes to vaccine messaging, I think you have to always be, um, you know, I, I think as you would advise, really honest, talking about risks and benefits, getting into the nitty gritty um, so that you prevent anyone from um, hijacking an issue like this and using it for a bad purpose. Uh, great point, Vinay. And, you know, I think of it in terms of how do we, manage this J&J &J vaccine in a time when we're rationing vaccines and how are we going to manage it when we have enough supply that we're not rationing? It's right. really a big factor in the, in the equation as to what we do, right? You're talking about the risk and benefit of getting a vaccine. And we talked about a few things that matter, your age, your comorbidities, and what's going on in your community. But the other thing you're talking about is if you didn't get this vaccine now, how long before you get a different one? And that's another factor that you have to include in this kind of calculation. If you decline a J&J &J vaccine right now, are you going to wait a week for Pfizer or Moderna? Or are you going to wait six weeks or six months? And that matters. I mean, I think it matters a great deal. I think we've seen estimates from the White House that we should have approximately 200 million Pfizer Moderna shots, which is enough to cover most adults, but not all adults, and certainly not all children, um, if they decide to move in that direction. So I think you're asking a really good policy question, which is, if if one makes a different choice now, when will you make uh, another choice in the future? And that has to be factored in. So we're about a week away from 50% of the adult US population getting vaccinated with at least one dose. And we've seen from the UK and Israel, which are further ahead of us, 
that about two weeks later, probably giving time for that immunity to kick in from all the vaccines, you really start seeing cases and new hospitalizations really plummet. So let's hope for some good news here in the coming weeks. You know, I know you've gotten some criticism for daring to offer good news in this space, but I think you're right to do that. And that's a very justified and reasonable thing to think that vaccines will, in fact, uh, abate this pandemic. They will. It's a matter of time. And um, I think uh, I, I'm hoping for the best, too. Well, look, I believe in science. you got to have humility and um, change as the data evolves. Um, you know, the projection that I put out really didn't account for outbreaks in five states of young people, uh, primarily who, who may be asymptomatic or mild disease. But you know what? It may be parts of the country get there at the end of April and other parts of the country get there in May. And that's good. It's good for us to get back to normal this summer and to give people some hope. So uh, I'm hopeful and hopefully the numbers will move in the right direction.